төлбөртэй иргэн тавтай морилно үзэгчтэй. Тэгэхээр форекс арилжааны бизнес Монгол харьцан гоо шин байгаач хувь хүмүүс арилжаанд бие даа оролцох асар их бололцоо байдаг юм байна. Яг энэ зах зээлийг сонирхогчдод зориулж олон улсын зах зээлийн тэргүүлэг шинжээч шилдэг трейдер Азийн номер 1 форексийн зөвлөх Марио Синг өөрийн биеэр Монгол дайчлан ирж форекс хэрхэн амжилт гаргах вэ гэсэн сэдвэр маргааш 15 цагаас тусгаар тогтнолын ордонд семинар зохион байгуулагдах гэж буу байгаа юм байна. Аа үгүй семинарт оролцож байгаа FX Primes company захирал яг одоо биднэ хамсууж байна. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for coming us. Hi Otka, thank mm -hmm. you for having me on Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my first question is about how to make success in for forex uh, market. Sure. This will be tomorrow's seminar. Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually have a seminar that goes on tomorrow in the Independence Palace. Well, let's just talk a little bit about what forex trading is because many people have a misconception that forex trading is very risky because most people will actually trade the, uh, the stock market. Like in Mongolia they will trade stocks. Uh, stock exchange but in in forex trading is actually something very simple we're just trading currencies right so let's just say if we are trading the US dollar uh, versus the Canadian dollar or we are trading the euro dollar versus the US dollar it is basically a play of two currencies and you can you are able to actually buy at any time or sell at any time so it's a it's basically a market that is bi-directional you can make profit both ways mm -hmm. so wh why is it too risky than the uh, capital market well, the, the, it's actually a misconception that Forex is risky. You see, the key thing is if you were to ask anybody, have you heard of the Forex market? And most people would say, yes, I've heard of it, but it's very risky. I've tried it and I've lost all my money. I've lost my house. I've lost my car. Mm -hmm. The key thing why many people think that Forex is risky is simply because they risk too much of their cash. As an example, if someone were to start trading with, say, $10,000, when they enter into the trade, they would actually risk the entire amount of $10,000. And if it doubles up from 10,000 to 20,000, they feel good about it. They think, oh, I've made 100% return on my capital. But the key thing is, what if you lost that trade? You would have lost 10,000 to zero. And that's when people think it's risky. So to solve all that things, all right, the most important factor is that for every trade, our job is to risk only a small percentage of capital. In the Forex world, my advice is you shouldn't risk anything more than 2% per trade. Mm -hmm. So I'm really inter in interested in your experience. So why did you choose this market and when did you enter this market? That's a great question. Now, about six years back, I was always dabbling a little bit into, into the stock market, all right, in the Singapore stock market. I just found it wasn't something for me. I found it just a little bit too slow. I had to hold and by the time I wanted to sell, I realized I had to hold my position for a few days because if I wanted to sell at a certain price, then someone on the other end must be able to buy and match me at my price. So when I had a time when a friend actually introduced me to the Forex market. He said, Mario, have you, have you heard of something called Forex trading? And I said, no, I really haven't. Could you explain it to me? And he said, all you really need is an internet connection and a laptop, and you could be literally anywhere in the world and you're trading the market. So I was hooked on it. When I saw my friend with a laptop and internet connection, and he started explaining some of the rules to me, I was hooked because it was essentially a market that is the largest in the world. The Forex market today trades 4.3 trillion US dollars every single day. It's the largest market in the world, which means at any point of time, if I want to click buy or click sell, I immediately get to transact. I was hooked from that time six years ago. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow will be your seminar. So uh, to the people who want to enter this market, what are, uh, what are the three only advice you want to give? Oh, this is great. It's a great question. In fact, I will be covering these three things more in detail tomorrow. Now, for anyone in Mongolia who wants to actually start trading the Forex market, it's very important for you to actually get a coach, right? But when you have a coach, it actually cuts short your learning curve. Now, if you don't have a coach, you will be spending a lot of time trying to figure out what there needs to be done. So my three quick advice for anyone who wants to start the Forex market, number one, you've got to decode breaking news. What that means is that there's so many central banks all around the world who is injecting money into the, the financial system. So you've got to understand what this, the central banks are doing. Number two, you have to learn how to execute live trades. Because when you execute live trades, you have that emotion that makes you very scared. So you have to learn how to do that. And number three, you've got to be coached by a, uh, a mentor or a teacher. So that these three advice would really help you to cut short your learning curve and help you to be very profitable in the Forex market. 
Okay, thank you very much. From your interview, I really wanted to uh, have a uh, foreign exchange trading. <laughs> you are most welcome, Otka, and I can tell you, you are most invited to my seminar tomorrow, 3 p.m. at Independence Palace. <laughs> I will go there. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. you very much coming as and being with Bloomberg TV Mongolia. Thank you. Well, let me just first say that, uh, let, let me start off by saying the differences between the stock exchange and the foreign exchange uh, uh, markets. First. Because many people who start trading, they would end up in the stock market. So let me just start with that. Now, there's three big differences between the stock market mm -hmm. and the forex market. Number one, I will use the word size. All right? The forex market is the largest financial market in the world. Mm -hmm. Today, it trades about 4.3 trillion US dollars in one day. Mm -hmm. Now, you compare that with, say, the New York Stock Exchange. All right, which is one of the largest exchanges in the world, they only trade about 50 billion right, in a single day. So can you imagine it's like, what, a hundred times smaller than the foreign exchange market? So number one is size, all right? Number two, in all stock exchanges, you can only trade a few hours a day. You know, uh, I was speaking to some uh, finance people here, and they're telling me that the Mongolian stock market is only open for a few hours in a single day. Now you compare that with the Forex market, which is actually open 24 hours a day, Mondays to Fridays. Right? Now, third reason is that most stock trading, people only buy hoping that prices go up. So it is something that what I call, uh, it is unidirectional. In the Forex market, simply because you are trading one currency over another, at any point of time, there is always the opportunity for one currency to go up or one currency to come down. With that, it simply means that in Forex trading, you can trade it bi-directional. We can go long at any time or we can go short at any time. So these are the three main differences why people in Mongolia must take up Forex trading. Number one, it is the largest financial market in the world. All right. Number two, you can be basically bi-directional. You can go long or short at any time. And number three, it is open 24 hours a day, Mondays to Fridays. Okay, thank you. So can you please explain the query trade for Mongolian uh, customers? How will you conclude uh, the benefit from uh, income from the uh, carry trade this year? Sure. Well, let me just uh, just uh, give a little bit of information. What exactly is the carry trade so that our, our friends will, will truly understand what it is. Now, the carry trade is essentially a very simple um, action that you would use in the foreign exchange market to achieve yield. Now, let me just explain that a little bit more. In the, uh, in the foreign exchange market, every single currency is tied to an interest rate. All right. So as a, as, as a pure example, uh, among all the G20 nations, Australia actually has one of the highest uh, carry trades. So one of the popular carry trades is to actually go long on the Aussie dollar versus the US dollar. Because when you go long, you're actually buying the Aussie and selling the US dollar. Right? Now, the Aussie is about 4%, 4.25%. So when they, when they go long on the Aussie dollar, they're essentially earning the yield from the Aussie dollar and paying off the currency that they're selling, which is the US dollar. Over the last few years, the US dollar has the lowest interest rate. So if you look at the net differential between the Aussie and the US dollar, they could earn about, say, 4% per year. Now, the problem with the carry trade is this, is that you are assuming that the Aussie dollar will always go up and it will never be the case. You see, the carry trade is only good if the currency that you're playing actually moves in the direction that you intend, right? So as an example, if you play the carry trade on the Aussie dollar, you are going long on the Aussie dollar. But what happens if the Aussie dollar actually drops? And that can always happen whenever China reports bad numbers. As an example, if China reports bad numbers for their purchasing manufacturers index, all right, Australia will suffer because China gets most of its raw material from Australia. So let me just say this, the carry trade will work in times of growth, in times of hope and greed, when people are feeling very um, exuberant about the markets. That's when the carry trade will work. Okay, so thank you. And uh, uh, my next question is about uh, the US and Europe monetary policies. This policy is uh, uh, how this policy reacts with the rest of the world, especially Qui trade. Uh, in what manner and how. Okay, so let's, let's separate that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the US first and then we'll, we'll, we'll go to Europe in a while. So let's just focus a little bit on the US. Now, on September 14th, you mentioned it exactly right. Some people call their action QE3. There are other people in the market that actually call it QE infinity. And the reason for that is because on September 14th, Ben Bernanke, which is the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he basically mentioned that he would inject 40 billion US dollars into the markets every single month with no expiration date. Now, this is something that was unheard of. 
Because if you look back at the past two quantitative easing measures, QE1 happened in November 2008. At that time, they injected 1.7 trillion US dollars into the market. All right? QE2 happened in November 2010. At that time, they injected 600 billion. So in total for QE1 and QE2, that's a grand total of 2.3 trillion US dollars. Now, QE3, which just happened two months ago, they said that they would now inject 40 billion every single month with no expiration date. Their only measure is that if unemployment rates actually come down. Now, and that is happening to the credit of the US market. That is actually happening because for the last close to four years, the unemployment rate in the US has been as high as above 8%. Only recently in the last two months, the unemployment rate in the US has dropped to about 7.8%. So that's good. Now, so now we understand a little bit about QE3. Now let's talk a little bit about how does that affect the markets, right? Now, if you take Q from what happened in QE1 and QE2, the single biggest thing that happened in the markets was that gold and silver actually shot up. Now, in the financial markets, many traders and investors treat gold as a perfect hedge to the US dollar. Now, that simply means that if the US dollar goes up, gold comes down and vice versa. All right, if gold comes down, the US dollar goes up. There's a very interesting quote on the, on the website of the, uh, the World Gold Council that actually says, if all factors remain equal, gold will go up if the US dollar comes down. So now let's play a little bit with that correlation. Okay, so in this case, if QE1 and QE2, because of the impact of the weakening of the US dollar, we saw how gold and silver actually went up to record highs. The same thing is happening now. In QE3, which was announced two months ago, gold and silver are hitting record highs. So that is the best play for financial professionals all around the world. Whenever the Federal Reserve were to announce a measure of quantitative easing, the best, uh, the best speculative play to, to put in would actually be a long trade on gold and silver. So that's on US, uh, the US economy. Now let's talk a little bit about, about Europe. Problems everywhere about Europe. Sovereign debt crisis, Greece has asked for a bailout, Ireland has asked for a bailout, Portugal has asked for a bailout, and right now as we speak, Spain is in the middle of asking for a bailout. Unemployment rates in Spain today is at 25%. Now that means one out of every four people in the country of Spain is unemployed. That's really bad. If you look at history again, whenever a country asks for a bailout, the euro dollar would tend to drop. However, in this case, it's just slightly different. Now, over the last two months, the entire European Union have convened. And it basically says, it gives the ECB, the European Central Bank, the mandate that if Spain were to ask for a bailout, they would now trigger a program called the OMT, which stands for Outright Monetary Transactions. My take is this, and it's very important for all professionals to understand this. If Spain were to ask for a bailout, do not short the euro dollar. All right? Although that has been the case for the last three countries, you should in fact go long on the euro dollar if Spain were to ask for a bailout. And the main reason is because the ECB now has the mandate to start buying bonds all right, of the sovereign nations. So the play is this, if Spain were to ask for a bailout, go long on euro dollar. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my next question is about uh, uh, how will you uh, evaluate the relationship between currency and bond prices? How's the, the happiness at the moment? So you say that some countries, including the US, uh, in Europe, and Japan, are starting to uh, testing to purchase uh, their bonds from the market. How it will uh, uh, influence with the currency? Okay, great question. Now, so the question is basically, what is the relationship between Forex prices and bond prices? Now, the first key thing for anyone who's involved in the financial markets, when you want to make a correlation or basically a comparison between Forex and bond prices, the most important thing to look at is something called interest rates. Let me explain. You see, when you talk about, even for carry trade, when you're looking at yields, everyone looks at interest rates. So this is where we have to put our ears to the ground and really see what are some of the moves by some of the central banks all around the world. As an example, this year alone, the Central Bank of Mongolia has actually raised interest rates twice. Yeah? The RBA, which is the Reserve Bank of Australia, has actually cut interest rates. So when we understand some of the economies all around the world, some economies will actually raise interest rates, some economies will actually drop interest rates. The key statement is this, whenever a country were to raise interest rates, chances are bond prices will fall. 
because bond prices always have an inverse relationship with interest rates. So here's the play now. Whenever you see any central bank around the world, if they were to drop their interest rates, chances are bond prices in that country would go up. Vice versa, for any country that were to raise interest rates, chances are bond prices will fall. Okay, thank you. And uh, what's uh, the currency war in the world for these days? How would you say it? Well, this, this, the currency war scenario is something very sensitive among all the economies all around the world. Probably the biggest thing as we speak, uh, uh, we're going to be having the US elections uh, sometime next week. And the most important part is that uh, if Mitt Romney were to win, uh, if the Republicans win, he's, he, he goes on air to say, if I'm elected president on the first day, I will call China a currency manipulator. Because US has always the impression that the renminbi or the Chinese yuan is undervalued. So the big part about currency wars is this fight between US and China, which essentially is the largest economy in the world. The US GDP is currently at 14 trillion, which is the largest economy in the world. And China at 5 trillion, which is considered the second largest economy in the world. So there will, in my view, currency wars will continue to, to, uh, to happen in, in the world. So FX Primus, uh, I represent FX Primus. I'm the Director of Trading and Education at FX Primus. The main reason why Mongolians should be trading with our company, uh, there's three major reasons. Now, FX Primus is a company that we provide retail brokerage services to all clients. Three major reasons why we feel we're the best in the business is this. Number one, we operate an STP model. Now, STP simply means we are a straight through processing broker. You see, in the brokerage world, there are basically two kinds of models, the dealing desk and the STP. A dealing desk simply means that when traders or investors were to execute a trade, the brokerage firm would actually bucket the entire trade. So that broker becomes the counterparty to your risk of the trade. Now, that is a risky model to the trader or the investor because then it seems that the brokerage firm is trading against you. Our model called the STP is essentially a straight through processing broker. That means that when a client were to click, uh, click buy or sell, the entire trade goes through us to the counterparties behind us so we do not absorb any risk. So that's number one, we're an STP broker. Number two, fund safety. All around the world, brokers have gotten a bad name simply because when brokers fail, MF Global is one example that we all know now in the world when MF Global fail, when they bet $6 billion on, the, uh, on, on European bonds. One of the key things is fund safety. Clients all around the world want to know when they deposit money with the broker, is that money safe? FX Premise has taken great pains to actually have a third-party fund administrator to govern the process of our funds. So that simply means whenever clients withdraw money, or they to deposit money, we have an independent company that sits on our board, all right, that's actually joint signatories with the directors of the company to ensure that there's no hanky-panky going on. So we have the highest level of fund safety. Number three, and finally, we have world-class trading tools. I hate the division of training and education. I'm very passionate about training and education. I've always felt that education is the key if someone were to trade profitably for a long time. So some of the tools that we have over here is daily analysis. We send out trade alerts. We in fact have daily coaching for all our clients who want to find out anything about the Forex market. So these three factors combined, we are an STP broker, we have the highest levels of fund safety, we have world-class trading tools, puts us at the forefront when we provide retail brokerage services to the people in Mongolia. Okay, so the question is, what are some of the indicators that will influence the, the US? Um, well. In, in the Forex market, there are basically a few economic indicators that we should look at. Right? Number one is something called interest rates. Whenever we trade the market, it's very important for us to look at interest rates. As an example, when a country raises interest rates, chances are the currency will strengthen. And the main reason for that is because investors, when they are scanning all around the world and they're looking for high yield, all right? so let's just say an example for, uh, for even Mongolia. All right? Mongolia for, the last, uh, for this year alone, the Mong uh, Mongolian Central Bank has actually raised interest rates twice. And when you raise interest rates, yes, the effect of drawing capital to the country because investors want to earn higher yield. So interest rates is one thing that you must look at. Another thing you must look at is something called CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, all right? And that it basically tells you the inflation levels. That's something important. Trade balance is another indicator that's important. And two more, the GDP of a country 
and the unemployment rate. So these are the five indicators that you must look at when you trade the Forex market. The most important thing for anyone to forecast or to understand currencies is to split the currencies into risk on currencies and risk off currencies. Let me explain. Now in the world, there's so many currencies that you could be trading. The Aussie dollar, the Kiwi dollar, the Euro, the, the Canadian dollar, the pound, there's so many currencies, right? How will we know at any point which currency would go up and which currency would come down? Here's an interesting tip. Now, the Forex market is traded by human beings and human beings are governed by emotions. Some of the biggest emotions in, in, our, in our heart are basically hope and greed on one end and fear and panic on the other end. Now, when it comes to hope and greed, there are basically three currencies that will move. The Aussie dollar, the Kiwi dollar, and the Canadian dollar. Because these three currencies are actually backed by commodities. So whenever there's growth in the world, whenever there's exuberance or even greed and arrogance, you would tend to see the Aussie, the Kiwi, and the Canadian dollar start to take off. When it comes to risk off environments, when people are feeling scared or fearful and they are trying to avert risk, the US dollar and the Japanese yen will take off because these two currencies are considered safe haven currencies. So in summary, as traders, we have to understand what is the dominant sentiment in the market right now? And if the sentiment is good, then the Aussie, the Kiwi, the Canadian dollar will move. If the sentiment is bad, the US dollar and the Japanese yen will then move. Okay, thank you for getting me into it. Good luck in your business. Thank you.